thank you. Uh, after the last uh, several talks, I think <laughs> you're going to be hearing a similar refrain. Um, as you can see, the title is slightly changed, but the uh, overall impact will, will be the same. Um, the main thing I'd like to emphasize, in addition to the sales animal and people of what we're doing, is that there are challenges which we're beginning to hear about. And I have to be able to work this, right? OK. All right, uh, my collaborators uh, uh, owe a great deal uh, of thanks. Uh, at Downstate, Anna Miller has performed all of the in vitro experiments, Richard Feynman, of course. And uh, the human studies uh, have been done uh, at Einstein and Montefiore. Uh, newer data uh, that we're hoping to obtain soon will require the uh, expert assistance of Alex Perlman and EUZU. Uh, we've been funded, uh, as previously uh, in the past, through the Atkins Foundation and State University of New York Research Foundation, and recently through <laughs> crowdfunding with experiment.com. That's a story of an entirely di different nature, so I won't discuss that now, except to say that Pete Evans, who is a low-carb chef in Australia, and Tayo uh, Priacito, who is a low-carb chef in Indonesia, were particularly generous donors to experiment.com. So this is a perspective of our work and a prospective of what we plan to do, uh, as I say, based on our experience and the work of many others, most of whom sit in this room. <laughs> Cancer is described as a heterogeneous genetic disease and uh, uh, with, uh, I think, an agreement really with uh, a somewhat moderated approach to Dr. Seyfried's, probably more in line with Dr. Sheck said. I think we have to think of it as a genetic and a metabolic disease which are intertwined. I really liked the model of the uh, of, of, the, of the yarn, of uh, the, the spool of yarn, which was totally tangled, because the, both the metabolic and the genetic changes, I think, are going on more or less simultaneously. And uh, the, the genetic ideas, however, and the molecular ideas, which we'll see in a minute, while likely having some validity, as I say, they invite very complex therapies, which don't usually work too well and have pretty serious side effects. So we're all familiar with the traditional uh, multiple cocktails of toxic chemo, which then fail. And now there are emerging gene targeting therapies, so-called personalized vaccines. And there are further emerging molecular targeting of important molecules, uh, signaling molecules in cells which are responsible for growth and resistance to apoptosis, molecules such as mTOR and PI3 kinase and so forth. Now as far as the emerging uh, vaccines are concerned, these personalized vaccines are fairly impractical as far as I can tell. They're going to be hugely expensive, rather toxic and invasive. In order to get antibodies to all of the antigens involved in a very heterogeneous tumor, uh, very heter heterogeneous cancer, you have to sample all the tumor sites. So if you have a metastatic disease that's wildly impractical and extremely uh, invasive, um, and you're still not going to succeed for the reasons that Dr. Sheck said. A cell over here in a big tumor is going to be different from one a centimeter away. And so uh, if you want to provoke a complete antibody response, you're not going to succeed. Even radiation, radiation therapy for uh, provoking an immune response is quite interesting, but you have to locate all the sites anyway and still therefore irradiate possibly multiple sites throughout the body very impractically. Now as far as uh, emerging molecular targeting, these are drugs that have been targeted to some of the more prominent signaling molecules. Uh, we, uh, there's serolimus or serolimus, I don't really know how it's pronounced, rapamycin is easier. <clears throat> there are congeners, uh, virolimus, and they inhibit mTOR, so they inhibit uh, the growth signaling molecule. And there are others. I, I don't really want to go into them other than the fact that there are drugs for each one and they all have side effects. Okay, uh, metformin is pretty well uh, tolerated, but uh, even so, uh, it, it will also have side effects. So let's just look at rapamycin just as an example. Now, the side effects of rapamycin include hyperlipidemia, uh, basically type 2 diabetes, mucositis, and an impaired immune response. And generally speaking, these things are not very good for people who have cancer. And I just quote from an article in Oncotarget, an editorial written by Dr. Solomon, uh, called About Face on the Metabolic Side Effects of Rapamycin, in which he ends up saying that the side effects could possibly be alleviated by pairing rapamycin with rosiglitazone. Well, isn't that nice? So are we going to now introduce yet further drugs to counteract the side effects of the existing drugs, which we, are, we didn't like to begin with? So, you know, I think we're missing something, and I think people in this room know exactly what we're missing. 
So rather than targeting a complex protein or gene expression with vaccines or with toxic drugs, let's take advantage of the commonality of most advanced cancers. And we know what this is. Most cancers display the glucose glycolytic dependent phenotype, the so-called Warburg effect, as beautifully described, and as this is often evidenced on a positive PET scan, which is then potentially responsible to ketosis, as we'll get to in a minute. Uh, let's just move quickly to the next slide. This is coming out very poorly. Huh. Is this contrast as bad as it looks to you? Well, anyway, this is supposed to show um, distribution of FDG, fluorodeoxyglucose. You can see that there's glucose in this radioactive compound. Uh, I'm sorry for the quality of the scan. Uh, the brain takes up in a normal patient, as often does the heart, depending on diet. There's excretion in the kidneys and the bladder. But this is a metastasis in the liver in this patient, and you can see that after failed chemotherapy, you have the same metastasis with additional new ones in the liver, and you can't see the two additional ones that are also in the lung. Okay, but a PET scan is basically an in vivo image which is an explicit manifestation of the Wilberg effect. It's actually how I got interested in the field. So most cancers display this uh, glucose and glycolytic dependence, and that's one of the commonalities. And the second is there are common growth-promoting apoptosis-resisting signaling pathways which are downstream of the insulin receptor. So let's take a look at that. The relevant molecules downstream of the insulin receptor on cancer cells <coughs> therefore are inhibited by insulin. So that ins re reducing insulin signaling in fact hits all of these targets simultaneously and without side effects because we know that inhibiting insulin through diet has minimal side effects. And they look pretty familiar because they're the same targets that I showed you a couple of slides ago that had all those drugs targeting it. So it seems that ketogenic diets might have a value in inhibiting insulin. And this is, uh, uh, you know, I, I like to put this because this is a, a, a drastically oversimplified signaling molecule diagram, which doesn't look drastically oversimplified to me, but apparently it is. And, um, and on it you can see that here are the uh, signaling molecules. There's PI3 kinase, mTOR, AKT, there's AMP kinase, all the things that I mentioned on the prior slide as all drug targets. Uh, there are also some other ones. There's the RAS, RAF, MEK, ERK pathway. I always say that when I first was exposed to this, it sounded like alphabet soup to me. I'm getting a little bit more used to it, but it still sounds that way a little bit. But anyway, I guess the point of the diagram, however, is that, of course, upstream of all of these molecules is the insulin receptor. There it is. And if you inhibit the insulin receptor, it turns out you affect all of those molecules exactly in the direction that you want to, and you haven't given a drug. So that's pretty good. So ketogenic diets result in maximum inhibition of insulin. And the insulin receptor is on the cell membrane. So to repeat what we've been repeating basically all conference now for cancer is why not inhibit insulin in secretion to inhibit all the signaling molecules simultaneously to reduce growth and proliferation, which some of those molecules stimulate, and to reduce the resistance to apoptosis, which they also and those are the, some of the hallmarks of cancer. And the second point, which is that you're not only reducing insulin in a ketogenic diet, you're producing ketone bodies. And so the question is, can ketone bodies themselves inhibit cancers? And we have evidence that they do, and we have conflicting evidence as well, but let's take a look at some of it. And they can inhibit cancers in a variety of ways. Uh, a little faster than I wanted it to show, but first, is something you've heard about already, the fact that ketone bodies have been shown to act as histone deacetylase inhibitors. And this has been shown by a variety of investigators over the last couple of years, and histone deacetylase inhibi inhibitors are being used in cancer therapy now because they themselves can cause apoptosis of cancer cells and or they can inhibit proliferation and growth of cancer cells, or both. They may do both. Second, uh, we've spent some time showing in a particular group of experiments in vitro direct inhibition of ATP production in a, a line of in several lines of cancer cells not seen in controlled fibroblasts. And this inhibition of ATP production, since cell growth depends on ATP, also res uh, results in growth and proliferation inhibition. 
And finally, we've heard from Dr. Boros that mitochondrial matrix water stabilization by ketone bodies uh, is, uh, will, it will stabilize mitochondrial matrix water compared with what glucose does, and that this can also inhibit ATP production in mitochondria. Now, as far as HDAC inhibition, uh, the brief description of it is that HDAC inhibitors disrupt the normal epigenic, epigenetic regulation of gene expression. Again, some beautiful slides that Dr. Uh, Sheck showed. Uh, and by altering gene expression, you, this can result in reduced cell proliferation, increased apoptosis, or both. Furthermore, it's been shown that short-chain fatty acids, including butyrate, valproate, hydroxybutyrate, and acetoacetate, have uh, HDAC inhibitor activity. Now, beta-hydroxybutyrate and acetoacetate act as anti-cancer drugs do, but without toxicity, and you don't have to administer them, except you could if you wish, but you could also put a person on a diet. So uh, John Mary Addison performed some very elegant experiments showing some HD HDAC inhibitor effects, effects using butyrate, and uh, in his experiments, he tested, it looks like, about 30 different colon cancer lines, which was his interest. And in comparison to the gray bars, which are the, um, um, the gray bars here are uh, carrier mat uh, material, you can see that five millimeters of butyrate had about, uh, in, this, in these cases, maybe tenfold as much uh, uh, apoptosis as did the carrier material, uh, uh, the controls. And about two-thirds of these cancer lines had truly significant apoptosis uh, as a result of incubation with five millimeter, uh, millimolar of butyrate. Uh, furthermore, uh, he also showed that sensitive cancer, that there's, that cancer lines that were sensitive to this also showed inhibition of proliferation. And uh, Shimazdu, excuse me, and Newman also showed that uh, beta-hydroxybutyrate, particularly, and also acetoacetate, both acted as HDAC inhibitors. And so uh, this has not been explicitly tested by Mary Addison in these cancer lines, but in fact we can anticipate that possibility. Uh, second, I'd like to talk about the direct metabolic inhibition of ATP production uh, in cancer cells due to overproduction in cancer cells of UCP2. I went into this a little bit last year and it has to do with the fact that most cancer cells really are living on the edge of death due to over overproduction of reactive oxygen species. And uncoupling protein 2 has the effect in cancer cells of just managing those ROS at barely survivable levels. ROS is in some ways the, uh, uh, the dollar bill of the cancer cell. It both uh, provokes the cancer cell to mutate towards a more aggressive form or it kills it and the cancer cell becomes a uh, suicide warrior on behalf of the team but it doesn't matter because the next cell will go on and do something bad. So overproduction of UCP2 is in fact quite common to uh, virtually all cancer cells that I've seen, and it has a secondary effect, however. Uh, well, first of all, it, because it's an uncoupler, as it happens, uh, there's an effect in which uncoupling protein 2 acts as an, an efficiency protein. And in fact, what it does is it causes reduced efficiency of production of ATP in cancer cells when you incubate them with beta-hydroxybutyrate and acetoacetate. Uh, actually, acetoacetate, I should say. And so this is the experiment that we did in which we compared three control fibroblast lines with seven cancer lines, uh, two breast and five colorectal. And it's a very simple experimental design. The hypothesis is basically that we look at, let's say this is a Petri dish, and you have a certain amount of cells in the Petri di dish at four days after glucose medium, you get this density of cells, which we'll call 100%. And in cancer lines, you do the same thing. This is your baseline density, and this is your 100% at four days. But if you grow the cancer cells in glucose medium plus acetoacetate, a ketone body, we're expecting the control fibroblasts to have no growth inhibition, and we're expecting the cancer, signs, uh, cancer lines to have growth inhibition. And rather astonishingly, that's exactly what we found. And so this was... Um, uh, all three cancer lines, we're showing the 100% bar is the black bar here, and you can see that uh, that means 100% of blue is growth and red is, is ATP, and all three fibroblast lines show 100% of growth and 100% of ATP at four days of incubation, whereas the cancer lines all show 
a different degree, however, of both inhibition of growth and ATP at four days, depending on the line. The least seen in MCF7, a breast cancer line, and the most seen about 50% of growth and ATP inhibition in one of the colon cancer lines. And in fact, you know, just from that, that, uh, that particular slide alone, I think you can appreciate exactly how amazingly linear the relationship is of uh, the uh, uh, growth to ATP. They, they line up almost perfectly, the relationship of growth to ATP re reduction, and that's what we see. It's a little bit unusual in biological experiments to see an R value of 0.948, where in fact you see that the controls lie on the same line as the cancers because uh, they have 100% of growth and ATP, whereas the cancers have a lower amount. But the R value is 0.95 and it's uh, very tightly correlated. And sure enough, the cancers all overexpress UCP2 in comparison to the controls. And in fact, as we would also expect, you can see that the least UCP produ to production correlates with, uh, very well with the most ATP, and the more UCP2 you have, the less ATP is produced. So this was shown in, uh, in uh, cell culture. So uh, yeah, we, we just showed that. So uh, others at this conference also have reported cancer inhibitory effects at the cell level or in animal models. Dr. Seyfried has shown this, Dr. Poff and D'Agostino has just discussed. Drs. Clement, Dr. Champ, Dr. Sheck, Dr. Boris and all, and I, I, I just want to acknowledge them because, uh, you know, this is, uh, this is all essential work that's being done. Human trials have been mostly case reports or trials with small numbers and without controls. So this is a very significant limitation of what we're dealing with. Uh, they've been done by a variety of investigators over the years, some of which have, we've all mentioned already. Uh, our study was... Uh, basically a safety and feasibility trial of a low-carb ketogenic di diet targeted to about 5% of total calories for 28 days in patients with advanced PET-positive cancers. And we did an entry and exit PET scan as a surrogate marker of efficacy, looking at the change in the FDG uptake as a surrogate marker. The patients were monitored for compliance as well as for the system systemic metabolic effect of whatever compliance they actually achieved by a weekly fasting beta-hydroxybutyrate concentration in the blood. Um, you know, dietary uh, nutrition recalls aren't that accurate, so the beta-hydroxybutyrate was essential. Now, the baseline data showed here that you can see that the patients ranged in age from about 52 to 73. There were seven women, three men. And most important, these patients were not picked by tissue type. You can see we had a variety of cancer types they were picked by phenotype, that's to say their metabolic behavior. They were picked because they all had a positive PET scan. So this was a very broad study. Uh, it was recommended against that we did this, but in a way I'm glad we did because it shows the commonality of the process, namely the Warburg effect. Uh, the patient, this, diets were all safe. None of these patients who stopped a day or two short stopped because of any unsafe adverse effect of the diet. One patient had a dental abscess, needed an extraction, and had to go on soft foods, and uh, she couldn't stay on the diet. Another patient had plane tickets that she had reserved uh, with advanced cancer, thought this was the last vacation she was going to take. We weren't going to stop her. These were not unsafe effects. Um, so what um, you do see, one patient is a little different, uh, is biologically different from the others. Uh, all of the patients had uh, multiple chemos except her. She refused everything. She had no surgery no chemo, no radiation therapy, yet she was still alive 14 years later, and she had a positive PET scan, and we know this was an aggressive cancer. Uh, she had, we had pictures in her file from uh, five years earlier which showed chest wall invasion at that time. So, you know, beggars can't be choosers. It took us four years to collect these 10 patients, and we didn't think of it at the time, but the fact that she was going to end up having stable disease meant we had to exclude her from analysis because she was growing, obviously, so slowly that we wouldn't detect her in a one-month study as having progressive disease. So anyway, but the short story is that the, all the patients were calorie uh, deficient for reasons that we tried to overfeed them. This was an outpatient study. Their dietary recall records suggested they ate one-third less on, uh, on the diet than their predicted energy needs, and they all lost weight. However, the calorie restriction that they showed and the weight loss that they showed had no correlation with the outcome. That's interesting because we say that calorie restriction is important. It, was, it did not appear to have a relationship in this very small study. 
we can see that uh, this is the segregation of the patients according to their metabolic response. This is the patient we had to exclude because she was uh, too indolent. Her disease was growing too slowly. But you can see that the patients who had stable disease or partial remission was one of them, uh, had ketosis of about 10 to 20 fold over baseline. And the patients with progressive disease had basically less than five fold baseline, but there was one over, uh, overlap. Okay. And, and overall, you know, there's no statistics here to speak of in a 10-patient study, but basically the patients with progressive disease partial remission had about threefold the level of ketosis if you want to make averages of these numbers. And as expected, you know, ketosis and insulin were inversely correlated. So this was a prospectively designed and executed pilot study. Oops. Uh, 10 patients completed it without unsafe adverse effects. Ketosis was observed and it correlated with insulin inhibition. The extent of ketosis correlated with disease stability, and there was unplanned calorie reduction and weight loss, but this was uncorrelated with disease stability. But we have to be very careful about interpreting everything that we've talked about here. In vitro findings don't often extrapolate to in vivo results, including our own. Rodents aren't usually good models of human metabolism. We're all forced to use them, but we don't like them. The few human, human studies that have been performed have been in small numbers of patients and without control groups, including our own. And other caveats have to be considered, and let's just start with genetic mutations. Okay, we had this, uh, this uh, thing before. Okay, this was our uh, signaling molecule diagram. If you inhibit insulin, it won't make any difference if you have a constitutive activation in the PI3 kinase uh, molecule. Uh, that was shown by uh, Kalani and Sabatini, that you will not affect downstream uh, signaling molecules if you have constitutive upregulation of PI3 kinase or mTOR or any of or, or those molecules. So the signaling molecules will get in the way if they have, uh, and so you will then end up not affecting things like growth or inhibiting uh, apoptosis, okay? So that reducing insulin may not benefit cancer with, which have mutations in critical pathways. And I just want to point this out, that breast cancer has uh, Stemke inhale showed that there's a PI3K constitutive activation mutation in 35% of ER-positive ER breast cancer and 23% of HER2 positives. Endometrial cancers have about 50% mutations in that pathway. Colorectal cancers have about 40% in KRAS and 40% in PI3K constitutive activation. So this is a problem. However, Cancers without such mutations still represent 65% of ER positive, 50% of endometrial, and 35% of colorectal, right? And ketosis, which is due to liver function, right, which is independent of the cancer cell signaling stream downstream uh, of the insulin receptor on the cancer membrane, therefore has independent effects that still might be beneficial. So you, say you have two mechanisms in parallel. One is directly on the cancer cell from insulin, and the other is ketosis, which happens in the liver. So, but caveat two, ketosis may not always inhibit cancer. Mary Addison showed that the HDAC inhibition is present in most, but not all colon cancers tested. Our data were in vitro and relate only to seven tested cancer lines. Glutamine is often an alternate substrate for aggressive cancers. Now, that's a very interesting thing which nobody I, I've heard discuss much here, but I just want to point out that glutamine is regulated by one of a, a, a gene signaling protein, which I didn't mention, MYC. Uh, and MYC tends not to be mutated, but it tends to be um, uh, multiply expressed. It, it, you tend to get uh, multiple copies of MYC, which then overregulates uh, glutamine expression. Fascinatingly, however, HDAC inhibitors also may inhibit MYC, so we may end up getting that effect anyway. Well, anyway, we don't know, but it's all unproven yet in cancer, so a lot of work still has to be done. And finally, Michael Lasanti's work, which was quoted, the so-called reverse Warburg effect, and others have also claimed that some brands, uh, breast cancer types actually feed on ketone bodies. Okay. So, finally, caveat three, are all patients susceptible? We have to not understand not just the behavior of the cancers, but also of the patients. And we think that we would think that ketogenic diets to treat cancer patients, for example, with type 2 diabetes or with prediabetes would treat both at the same time. This, however, has to be proven. It hasn't been shown. Insulin resistance is usually at the fat, muscle, and liver, liver cellular level. What happens at the cancer level is as yet unknown. What happens when you inhibit insulin, it's not shown, known what happens to the response of uh, the glute receptors and things that may be uh, at that. So this is unstudied. And in fact, in our recharge trial of, again, only 10 patients, the four patients who had progressive disease had the greatest evidence for prediabetes. So who knows?
Anyway, none of the caveats and limitations should distract us from the potential advantages of a free and non-toxic metabolic approach in susceptible patients and cancers. That's the positive message. <laughs> I want to come out with something positive here, and it's, and it's real. So our goals should be very simple. We need to identify the cancers and the patients in advance who are sensitive to insulin inhibition and or ketosis. So new directions that we've been trying to pursue is to expand up from a small study of 10 patients and to inclu include controls. So right now we're working on obtaining funding for this. Uh, fingers are crossed, but we'll see what happens. And so we're trying to scale up to 45 patients on a ketogenic diet and 20 controls on an isocaloric uh, low-fat uh, uh, low uh, diet. And uh, I won't go into the details because I think time is running short. We're also trying to couple diet and drugs. We want to study diet and, and rapamycin in a, a mouse model where we do four arms, standard diet, standard diet plus rapamycin, ketogenic diet, ketogenic diet plus rapamycin, and we're going to measure a variety of parameters. And finally, we'd like additional ways of measuring ketone bodies in vivo, and we're in the process of developing a radio-labeled ketone body in conjunction with collaborators at University of Alberta. Stephanie Mattingly uh, has been working on this and has made astonishing progress. She now has two precursors, which basically are at the point where she's ready to substitute directly she, uh, for a fluoro, uh, fluorine 18 labeled beta hydroxybutyrate and a fluorine 18 labeled acetoacetate. And these could then be used in humans. And I mean, well, not immediately. There would be an awful lot of work that would have to be done. I can't predict for you right now what, what exact value would come from this tracer because a lot of studies would have to be done. You'd have to do normative findings first, then you'd have to do it under different dietary conditions for cancers and for a variety of cancers and so forth. It would be the third F18 labeled meta, uh, metabolic tracer after F FDG and F18 glutamine. So as I say, its practical uses aren't explicitly known, but it may permit exploration of, of in vivo mechanisms of ketogenic diets and cancer and identification of susceptible patients. And so, you know, this is a terrible slide, but we're hoping it would look something like this, but better. <laughs> and I want to finish with a quotation from James Watson, because obviously co-discoverer of the, of the gene structure. When he, this is from uh, Cancer World and uh, reported by Anna Wagstaff. The inherently conservative nature of cancer research establishment as the biggest op is the biggest obstacle today to moving forward effectively toward a true war against cancer because they're still too closely wedded to moving forward with cocktails of drugs targeted against growth-promoting growth molecules. So I find that remarkable coming from James Watson, who also says that he would, if he, had, he were in charge, he'd attack the uniqueness of the biochemistry of cancer cells. We still don't know the reason for the Warburg effect. You have to unleash biochemistry, and there's no biochemistry left because everybody moved into DNA. Well, not everyone in this room. So, thank you.